everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for today's Total Attorneys Power Chat. Today we're speaking with Rachel Rogers on how you can go solo straight out of school. And today's session is specific, specifically for a lot of our recent graduates who are considering opening their own law practice. Um, Rachel herself has a thriving law firm as well as being the author of a great blog called Gen Y JV and in general has really established a very unique practice for herself that is tailored to um, the type of uh, lifestyle that she would like to lead and um, the area of law that she's personally interested in. Rachel, thank you so much um, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and, and look forward to um, hearing your experiences building your practice. Thank you, Chelsea, uh, so much for that introduction. Um, and um, I'm happy to share my experiences. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to share today I have you know, either done myself or I have made the mistake and not done and wish I had done. So um, hopefully the information will be very useful to people looking to start a solo practice right out of law school. Absolutely. Um, I think that it will. Um, and if any of our listeners have um, issues during today's session, you can email powerchathelp at totalattorneys.com and someone will be able to assist you. And if you have questions for Rachel, you can either chat them to us inside of the GoToWebinar tool or you can email powerchat at totalattorneys and we'll get those answers for you at the end of the session. So we can go ahead and jump in. Um, to today's first slide, and I'm going to hand it off to you, Rachel, really kind of breaking it down, talking about the vitals um, of, the, of what is needed to start a law firm for the first time. Okay, great. Um, well, first, I, I wanted to start with um, one of the things that I say here is the important stuff you don't need to know. Um, it's, it's important information, but I think one of the things that you want to be clear on is why you're doing this. You know, what is the reason that you're going into um, starting a solo practice? Because it's going to take sacrifice and commitment. Um, and, you know, it'll, you will I worked harder than I ever have in my life, but loved every minute of it. Um, and so I think it's important to know the why, you know, why you're doing it. And then once you do that, everything else will just start to fall into place. You know, you'll just kind of figure out all the little pieces out of necessity. Um, but a lot of the information I'll share will be useful, um, I think, to you. So one of the things we're going to talk about, well, a couple of things we're going to talk about is uh, the finances, um, how to get together your startup money, uh, whether you need startup money, how do you survive when you know, you're know you not getting a salary for the first couple of months, um, what your uh, niche is going to be. I think that's a huge, huge piece that really determines a success for a lot of solo lawyers. The fees and what your philosophy on fees are, I'll talk a little bit about flat fees versus hourly. Uh, mentorship, which is so, so important for new lawyers, and um, how to get mentors. And then also promotion, you know, how to market yourself and how to get clients, because that's, that's one of the most important things, right? So, and I think that's something that a lot of um, young lawyers are scared about is, you know, where will the clients come from? So we'll talk about that as well, and hopefully all of that will be useful. Um, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 and so um, moving on to our first slide, let's Talk about that why factor, and and for you it was um, a unique uh, reason. I know that um, both of us share a passion for for traveling, so that had a little bit to do with the type of practice that you started. Yes, definitely. Um, and for me, uh, the the why was I wanted a location independent lifestyle, meaning I wanted to be able to live anywhere. When I thought about locating my practice. Where would I start my practice? There was like no place that I was comfortable with because, you know, I just wasn't ready to say, oh, I'm going to settle down and live here for the next 30 years. And if I had a traditional office, you know, that's what I would have to do because once you, you know, create a local kind of client base, you're kind of stuck there. So, <laughs> I mean, I know some lawyers that have moved their practices, but not very far. Um, and I've moved all over the country in the last couple of years. So, <laughs> um, so, yeah, travel is important to me. I wanted to be able to work from anywhere. I really wanted the freedom to set my own schedule. Um, I wanted greater income potential instead of just having a set salary uh, that I was sort of, you know, stuck with and that's all I was going to make. Here I have the opportunities and potential to take advantage of and, and kind of, you know, be able to make more money if that's what I'm looking for or to be able to scale back if I don't need to make more money. Um, so I wanted that option. 
And I wanted to use things, you know, use my gifts and talents and be able to kind of build a practice that I was very comfortable in instead of trying to force myself to fit into, you know, someone else's practice. Um, and I also, you know, I'm six months pregnant right now, and now I have the option to stay home with my child and be able to still do interesting work and work with clients, but um, be able to also be a stay-at-home mom or at least semi-stay-at-home mom. I'm, I'm right down the hall, basically, from my, <laughs> from my child. So, um, so, yeah, so these were some of the reasons why, and that really drove me, you know, just having that, knowing that this is the prize kind of thing and this is the lifestyle that I get to have um, is awesome and it just really motivates me every day and keeps me going. So I think it's very important to figure out your why. Why are you doing this and what, the, what is the type of lifestyle that you want and then build a practice that's totally based on that, based on what you want out of life, how much you want to make, where you want to live or where you don't want to live, you know, <laughs> all those little pieces. Um, I think that's the first step to figure out uh, when you're thinking about going solo. Absolutely. I completely agree. And, um, Congratulations, by the way, and oh, thank you. <laughs> I I think that that is so important. Just n not just from a um, revenue perspective of, of you know identifying a niche in an area that is going to make you um, personally happy, but just establishing a work life balance for yourself, um, allowing you to move or to spend time with your family or whatever your personal goals may be. It's, it's more than just bringing home a paycheck at the end of the day. It's also having that personal satisfaction that's important to building um, a, a firm that suits your life as well. So um, it's, a, it's a great place to start. And the next step would be startup cash, which is really, you know, I think a, a lot of us that have started businesses, um, you know, you have a, a lot of sleepless nights trying to figure out you know, how much money you're going to need to, to get your idea or, or your business off the ground. And I think now it's a lot easier than it used to be and requires a lot less capital um, than would have been required, you know, a few years ago. So let's jump into maybe some of the items that you really think you need on day one. Yes. Um, I didn't have it, and just so everyone knows, I, I don't have a trust fund. I don't have a rich husband, <laughs> so I didn't have any, you know, sort of stash that was um, available to me to start a practice with. So I really just kind of used the necessities, which were a laptop. I used my old beat-up laptop from law school. Um, I already had a smartphone. I had a BlackBerry. Um, and, you know, uh, I had the only thing that I actually purchased was malpractice insurance, and it cost me about 160 bucks a month. So that was my startup costs were 160 bucks a month <laughs> um, for the first couple of months. That's all I spent. I didn't spend another dime um, on day one. Um, and then you know I sent out an email kind of announcement and you know shared what I was doing on you know Facebook and other like social media channels to let um, like the low hanging fruit like my friends and family. Um, and their extended friends and family know that I was, you know, doing this, that I was starting my own practice in the area that I intended to practice, which was business law. Um, and that's all I needed, literally, on day one. I've actually, I, I, I spent a lot of time during my clerkship, so I did a clerkship right after law school, and during that clerkship, when I was thinking about going solo, I talked to a lot of other attorneys. One, uh, you know, two attorneys actually that had like a little small practice and they were pretty much just out of law school. They had amassed a little bit of money. It was like, you know, $20,000 in startup funds that they had kind of gotten together to start their practice with. And they spent the vast majority of that on marketing, like getting into lawyer directories on law and also um, on research on like a Westlaw account or something like that. And they told me that they felt it was a complete waste of money and they wish they wouldn't have spent it. So you're actually probably better off if you don't have the money because then you won't waste it. <laughs> so. I, I completely agree. There was a, a lot of things that I thought that I needed when I first started a business that, you know, things change. Two months down the road, you might um, take your business in a different direction because you see an opportunity or six months down the road, um, a new a advertising opportunity is available to you. So I definitely recommend you know, baby stepping your way in and making sure that, um, you know, you're, you're spending what um, startup cash you, you do have on things that you absolutely cannot live without. Exactly, exactly. So I would be as cheap as possible when starting out. <laughs> that's, that's my recommendation. <laughs> and, and let's talk a little bit about sur surviving the startup phase, the sleepless nights, the long hours, um, you know, really kind of trying to get by with, 
um, as little as you can until you have a strong client base to support you. What was that like for you? Um, yeah, well, one of the things that I did that was huge was um, cut my expenses substantially. And of course, I had to talk with, had to have a talk with my husband about it and say, you know, this is what I think is required in order to get this done. This is what we're going to have to live off of, and this is how we're going to have to cut our expenses. You know, and he was totally on board, which was great. And so what we did was we actually owned our house um, outside of New York in New Jersey, and so we rented out our house and moved to a smaller one-bedroom apartment um, and had, you know, sold a lot of our stuff because we no longer could fit it into this one bedroom um, and had much cheaper rent, much cheaper, you know, utility bills and stuff like that and saved a lot of money that way. And then we also had the rental income kind of covering most of our mortgage. So that's what we did. We downgraded our car. My husband was so sad about this. This is the one piece that he was hurt by. <laughs> we had a really lovely vehicle that we, you know, got rid of and got like, you know, an old, you know, beat up Nissan Altima. <laughs> and so we cut our expenses substantially and that really enabled us to be able to uh, take the chance and take the risk um, of not having, you know, large sums of income that we had been used to um, coming in. So, so that was huge, you know, getting not no longer having my salary. My husband is also in a career transition, so we were both doing it at the same time. Um, so yeah, so I think cutting expenses is huge. The biggest way to do that is to cut down your housing, and that's what I highly recommend. If you can live with your parents um, as much as we don't like to, <laughs> or if you have a sister, or if you can bring on a roommate, maybe you have an extra room in your house and you can rent out the extra room. Um, those are just some ideas for um, cutting the housing expenses, or even if you can relocate to a less expensive city or a less expensive area, that might be something that um, is a possibility. Just cutting out, you know, like going out to dinner and Starbucks is not going to do it, I don't think. <laughs> so you really want to be as lean as possible uh, because that enables you to maneuver and kind of take advantage of opportunities. So when you have your first couple of clients and the money coming in, you can reinvest it in the business and you don't need to use it to pay your rent. So that's one of the big things. And um, your, your law practice is primarily um, virtual and, and that's something that could potentially be a great way to reduce and make sure that you're um, minimizing expenses is starting um, a law practice uh, with a home office or online as opposed to going out and signing a lease because you feel that you need to have a nice conference room or a receptionist at the front of your office um, and, and coffee and all of those other things that come with it. Um, you know, establishing the client base first and then moving into a more permanent space. Exactly. That's what I highly, highly recommend is getting a couple of clients first even making sure you really want to do this or making sure you have the right practice area or seeing the ways in which you're, you know, serving clients because then you get feedback because really any business, whether it's a law practice or some other type of business, you really are kind of testing in the beginning, seeing what works, what doesn't work and kind of maneuvering based on that information that you get as a result of doing the first couple of cases. So I think it's best to be as lean as possible you know, having a virtual law office has worked perfectly for me, being able to work from home and being able to work with clients virtually. And I can tell you right now, based on my experience, I mean, maybe there are clients who do really want to see you in person, maybe in certain practice areas. But for my practice area and for a lot of my colleagues that I know, um, you know, clients really, really don't care about the, you know, trappings of your office. And they don't want to pay for it. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> if they, if they, you know, I think you can really, really benefit from, you know, uh, operating leanly and then being able to pass on some of those savings to your clients. They really care about, I think clients care about two things. One is going to be you, you know, you're selling yourself and your personality and whether they like you. And the other thing is going to be, can they afford you? Those are the two biggest questions that make clients make the decision. It really has nothing to do with your fancy office. <laughs> so you might as well save the money. I'm sure with the money that they save on legal fees, they can buy all the Starbucks they want. Exactly. <laughs> and let's talk about, you know, just that personal pressure of, you know, having student loans and having a mortgage and, and having to support yourself um, and, and having all of that going on at the same time that you're starting a business. What, um, what advice could you give um, our, our other graduates that are facing that as well? Well, I think the number one thing to do is get organized. Um, organizing your loans and getting the big picture and seeing when they're all due, what the monthly, um, 
you know, what the monthly bill is, and, you know, if you have it in deferment or in a grace period, knowing the date that it comes out of that deferment or grace period, just keeping track, because I know through law school, you take out loans, like, every semester or every year, and so you have, like, a bunch of different loans, so it's, it's a lot to manage. So what I did was I created an Excel spreadsheet that had all that information on there, contact information, um, the dates, the total amounts, the interest, um, what the monthly fees were, and I put all of that into a big Excel spreadsheet, all my law school loans and my undergrad loans, um, and then I could at least see, okay, this is what's going on here, and just knowing makes you feel better, trust me. <laughs> so I would definitely take the time to do that and do it right away if you can, if you haven't already. Um, for me, my situation is I have the vast majority of my loans are currently in deferment, I have like the two smallest loans is what I'm paying right now. So I just pay whatever the monthly is for those two small loans because those are the ones that I can afford. Once I knock those out, then I'll move on to the next one. And that's kind of how I'm working through it. For me, the way that my loans are set out and the interest, some of the interest like on my undergrad loans is so low and some of the interest on my law school loans is so high that consolidating really didn't make sense for me. Um, but consolidation is definitely an option and that, you know, can help take some of the pressure off because you have one loan to manage, you know, or maybe, you know, you have your federal loans all in one place and then you have your private loans. So you have two loans to manage, you know, so it might be a little bit easier to consolidate. And I know that they have like an income dependent repayment program uh, when you consolidate. So you can, you know, have all your loans in one place and maybe pay $200 a month or something like that, whatever is based on your income. I actually have a friend who worked at the prosecutor's office and because she made so little money and had such a high amount of loans, she was like paying zero dollars a month. <laughs> but that zero dollars a month because she was signed up for this income de dependent repayment program actually counts towards the 10 or 25 years you have to make payments on and then you get like loan forgiveness after. It's 10 years if you're in public interest and it's 25 years if you're in private. So that's something to look into. But I think the first step really is just to get the big picture, put all your loans in one place, and really see what's going on so you can manage it. Great. That's extremely helpful. Um, and now let's talk about really uh, focusing and finding your niche. So we're organized. We have our why reason. We know um, what we need to start on day one. We've reduced our expenses, and now we're really going to start to build our practice. And the, and the first step of that is really to define um, that niche. And, and for you, it is um, really uh, young entrepreneurs, um, and a lot of which are um, some, some in the technology space. Is that correct? Yes, definitely. Um, and I'll tell you, well, I'll tell you a little bit about how I, I came up with my niche just because my first couple of clients were all people under 30 who had either gotten laid off from their jobs or something had happened that caused them to start thinking about entrepreneurship. And then they decided they were going to start their own businesses. And they were all somewhat ambitious businesses, too. <laughs> and so they had all contacted me and said, you know, I need a lawyer to help me with some aspects of getting my business up and running. And so I was helping each of them doing different things. One was purchasing, uh, you know, a uh, salon. Another one um, was starting a food, re a food industry business. And the other one was uh, starting a nonprofit. So, you know, all kind of different things, which I will recommend against later, but, <laughs> um, you know, I just looked at what their characteristics were and saw that they all had similarities in that they were all young and they were all starting their own businesses. And they really liked having me as a lawyer because they felt comfortable with me because I was also young and they felt they could relate to me rather than kind of going into a fancy office with an older, stodgy person there um, who, you know, they wouldn't feel as they related to. So I, I felt like that would be a good niche area, and so I decided to just go with it and see what happened, and it kind of has taken off. Um, and that's one of the things about the niche is that it really, really helps you market yourself, and people fall in love with you because of, you know, because you're, they feel like you get, they get, that you get them, you know. Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, I'm, my mom is Irish American, my dad is African American. So I'm biracial, and so I, you know, have tried different salons. Some salons are, like, focused on hair that's, like, usually Caucasian. There's other salons that are focused on African-American hair, and neither one of them quite is perfect for my type of hair because I've got this, like, weird hair, you know. So <laughs> I, like, Googled something, I don't know, and I 
wound up coming across a hair salon that focused on biracial hair. And I was like, oh my god, I love this place. And so to this day, I mean, I currently live in Arizona. I travel back to the New York area twice a year to get my hair done at this place because I love them. And I tell every biracial woman I know about them, you know. So it's kind of like when you find something that's like so you, so perfect for you and somewhat unique, then you're going to be, those clients are going to be super excited about you and about your practice area. And that's why the niche is so important. If you just do criminal law or real estate law or family law, that doesn't really speak to the person. But if you narrow it down somewhat, it really can. So I think that's one of the main reasons why, why the niche is so, so key. And then the other thing is, is that it's easier to manage. If you're a younger lawyer, you're, you're figuring out the ins and outs of actually practicing the law. You know, you may know the substantive stuff, but you've got to figure out where to file things and, you know, the right forms and all of that. And so it's easier to manage if you just have one area of law that you have to do that for. And there's also less to learn. So I think there's, these are the reasons why the niche is so, so key to me. Absolutely, and I think it also makes it easier to really establish yourself as a thought leader in that space because you're not talking about a general practice where today you have to write a blog post on criminal defense and tomorrow you're going to write a blog post on personal injury and the day after that. And you know, you almost have to have different personalities for each of those practice areas. And when you establish and, and find what niche really works for you, especially if it's something that you're passionate about, um, both personally and professionally, um, then it becomes a lot easier for you to uh, really share your thoughts and feelings on that topic um, with the world. I, I know a number of attorneys that have really um, come into their own in, in the environmental law space because they're passionate about, um, about what they do and they care about the environment and others. It's animal rights um, and it, it really, really translates when you hear them speak or when you read um, blog posts or that, you know, what they're posting on Twitter. And you can tell that they love what they do and that they're also very um, trusted experts in their field. And that's right. expected clients. Exactly, exactly. And so I think that's why, you know, you can express that passion. You can have a really clear focus. You know where to go to find your potential clients because you have only, like, you have, like, this specific avatar that represents your um, type of clients, and it's not just you know everyone. Because if you try to appeal to everyone, you'll appeal to no one, and you'll have that corporate-y feel that no one likes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and on the corporate note, let's talk about showing me the money. Um, establishing um, principles and philosophies on fees. And you know, I think, Rachel, this is a really important topic, because I know a lot of attorneys struggle with this. It's, it's the balance between well, I want to get clients, and I want them to like me, and I want to be, you know, the cool, um, you know, attorney that everybody comes to and they feel comfortable talking to. But at the same time, it, you walk a fine line between giving away a lot of services for free and, and not getting paid and really drawing that hard line in the sand and saying this is the expectation of, of what I'll be paid for services. Right, right. And, and that's the thing, the thing to understand about, you know, lawyers' fees is that they're all over the place. I know attorneys that charge $1,500 for the same thing that another attorney charges $10,000 for. And it has a lot to do with who your clients are, the type of people you're trying to serve, maybe where you're located or um, you know, where your client base is located. So those are some of the things to keep in mind. I think you have to really establish what you're comfortable with. For me, you know, I really, really wanted to focus on serving the client well and in a way that really benefits them while also, you know, getting fees that are, that are you know, um, enough to cover, you know, obviously my overhead and also to provide uh, a good income for me. So it's really hard to find that balance. I think the first step is to know that you're going to screw it up, you're going to make mistakes, and that's what happens. So just be prepared to get it wrong. You're going to take a matter or two. Most likely what you'll do is undervalue yourself and then You'll be pissed that you're doing so much work for so little money. Um, and then you'll learn from that and know, you know what to do the next time. I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the pluses and minuses of flat fees versus hourly fees. And just a disclosure, I am totally biased towards flat fees, so just so you guys know. <laughs> but I will talk about the pluses and minuses of both of them. Um, first of all, with flat fees, I think they really serve clients better because they know exactly how much it's going to cost them to deal with you, period. Whereas hourly... You can tell a client your hourly rate, say your hourly rate is $300 an hour, 
but that means nothing because they don't know at the end how long it's going to take you. You could even give them an estimate of time, but that still doesn't really make it clear to them exactly how much they're going to have to part with in order to work with you. And I think that also um, results in a lot of lawyers have trouble getting their bills paid sometimes. So you, you know, maybe you accept a retainer up front, and then it takes longer time, and then you try to um, collect the balance of the of you know the fees, and the client doesn't want to pay it because as far as they were they understood that retainer really they thought it was going to cover the whole thing you know um, so so that's one of the drawbacks I think clients are more likely to pay fees also in certain states you don't have to have the money sitting in a trust account when you use flat fees as long as you put it in I know California for an example. If you put it in your retainer agreement or your uh, engagement agreement that you know flat fees are collected are considered collected upon you know receipt, that means that you can go ahead and put it in your operating account instead of having it sit in your trust account for months while you you're doing the work. One of the benefits of that is you know you have the money to use for your overhead or for um, whatever your needs are. So that's another benefit. Um, and then the last thing, which I think is the biggest with flat fees, is that you get paid for your expertise and not your time. So if something takes you, you know, an hour to do because you have the expertise or experience to do it, you're only going to get paid for an hour if you do hourly. Whereas, you know, maybe that matter has a really huge value to the client and therefore you can charge more because, you know, you're, you're meeting a certain need for the client and it has a large value to them so they're willing to pay more for it. But if you do hourly, then you're just going to get paid for your hour. So it's almost like the better you get at what you're doing, the less money you'll make <laughs> because you'll be able to work faster. So those are some of the pluses and minuses. I think the biggest plus for hourly is that it's predictable for you as the attorney. I mean, it's easy to set. So um, you can set an hourly fee, and that's it. You don't have to come up with a number for each different service that you offer. So that makes it a little easier. And so you have to really decide for yourself what works for you. Absolutely. And, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for um, many, many practice areas moving to the flat fee structure, especially um, what we've seen with the economy over the last few years. Consumers are a lot more conscious of what they're paying, not just, you know, in the grocery store and, um, you know, in their everyday purchases, but also when they need things um, such as estate planning or when they want to start a new business or various other areas. So. Um, flat fees are, are becoming more attractive to them. One point that I would like to um, just reiterate is the organization that you mentioned earlier. If you are operating on a, on a flat fee structure, it's really important to keep track of that time and really understand you know, where your margins lie and how much room you have in there. Um, and also, you know, if you're offering incentives or referral uh, discounts for clients who refer their friends to you, you know, just knowing where the line is and how much time you're spending on those cases. And then also um, looking for the opportunities, as you mentioned, where uh, a, a specific type of, of matter may be more valuable and not necessarily take as much time, but the value to the client is there. And the next is, is valuing yourself um, and, and really valuing your expertise, um, talking to other attorneys, checking out um, other practice websites, and um, that preparation, because if not, it could potentially go wrong. Can you talk through a few of those points with us? Yeah, definitely. I think talking to other attorneys is the best way. Um, I actually have had a couple of attorneys even send me their, their fee schedule. So, you know, I can see where they're at and then kind of compare and contrast where I want to be or where I want to fall in the spectrum. Um, so it's a good way to get an idea of, you know, the range for different services that you offer. Um, and then also checking out virtual practice websites because a lot of uh, lawyers who have virtual law offices will put an estimate of their of some of their fees or, um, you know, say what fees are starting at. Like on my side, I have what fees start at for different matters. Um, and I think that's really essential if you have a virtual law office because clients are going to shop around a little bit because it's easier. They can just go from website to website. And I think it also attracts them a little bit to uh, be able to put your fees on there so that they know uh, whether they can afford you before they call. Because I think that's one of the biggest things for potential clients is they walk into a lawyer's office, they have no idea whether they can afford that attorney or not. And they won't know until after they've spent some time with the attorney 
Um, and I, I think that is the problem. It's the not knowing. It's not so much the number, but it's the not knowing. So if you can kind of give them an idea so they have a range, and then they'll know whether they can afford you or not, and then they'll be more likely to give you, pick up the phone and give you a call or register for your virtual law office online. Absolutely. And that actually um, speaks really well to our next slide of finding mentors, um, which is, I think is a huge, huge part of um, really getting into uh, practice and becoming comfortable working with clients and you know just everyday activities. It's so nice to have someone to bounce ideas off of and, and really kind of help you by telling their own horror stories or, or sharing their own um, war wounds of, of their own early days. Right, right. I think that, yeah, mentorship is huge and I've had many uh, mentors and I have a lot of different attorneys that I can call if I ever get stuck um, or if I want, you know, if I need a template or something like that um, or just want a second opinion on, on a case that I'm working on. So I think that's been huge for my success and I think it's very important for young lawyers to have that because you can almost have the partner associate type of relationship um, but with an attorney who's not within your practice you still get that autonomy of having your own solo practice. So uh, for me, one of the things that I did was, you know, I kind of formed my existing contacts somewhat and looked at people that I had interned with. I think really focus on solo attorneys um, because lawyers who are in even small firms with like five or more lawyers or big firms, they just, they don't tend to be as, um, let's, what's the word I'm looking for, <laughs> sympathetic <laughs> to your situation as solos are, where solos remember just starting out, and so they um, a lot of times are really, really invested in helping you. You know, I've cold called and cold emailed tons and tons of attorneys and got a response from every single one. I think there was only one that I didn't get a response from, and every response was very positive. They were very generous with their time. Um, sometimes I was just looking for to get two or three questions asked, like, should I do this, should I not do this, or what are your thoughts on X, Y, Z? Um, and that really uh, gave me a lot of information to work with and, and helped me to make some smart decisions when I was starting out. So I think it's essential. I think there's a way to make it a win-win also. If you could, you know, maybe ask, a, ask someone who's a solo in your practice area if you could take them out to lunch once a month and maybe could you call them every now and then if you had a question. And to really develop one-on-one -on -one relationships, I think that's important. Um, the other thing is you can offer, you know, you could say, you know, for your expertise and maybe, you know, for the time that you take to talk to me maybe once a week or twice a month um, where I can kind of gather a couple of questions that I have and then ask you, call you, and we have a call, you know, periodically. In exchange for that, maybe I can help you with some of your matters or maybe I can do an appearance for you. Uh, when you're busy or something like that. So they can even contract some work out to you. The other thing is this is going to be a great way to get potential clients because these attorneys usually have more high-level cases. They've been around a little bit longer. Um, and maybe they have smaller matters that come in that they don't really want to take because it's not worth their time because they could take a, a, another matter that's going to bring in more money. So they can um, farm that out to you and, and send those, those clients to you. So you can kind of get some of their clients. And then if you have clients coming in that are you know, bigger than you are able to deal with, you can send them over to them, or maybe you could team up and you can second chair a trial uh, where they take the first chair and then, you know, you guys work together and you can learn from that experience and, you know, you split the fees. So there are a lot of different ways to make it a win-win. Think about what you have to offer. Sometimes it might be, you know, social media and you can teach them how to market their firm using social media, or maybe you know some new technology you can share with them if they're a little bit older. So there's a lot of different things I think that young lawyers have to offer older attorneys and vice versa. So try to find a way to make a relationship that really benefits them and you. That way you'll both be more invested in it. Absolutely. And um, there's actually a really great um, website called uh, lawclerkconnection.com um, and that was founded by Laurel Edgeworth in her third year of law school. and. Um, it's not only a place where um, recent graduates and students can um, start to establish relationship with attorneys to do contract work, but they also have some mentorship programs as well. Um, I know you also participate in Solo Practice University, um, your, your local state and um, 
State Bar as well as the ABA's GP Solo Division. There's a lot of really great resources out there. So even beyond just um, your own personal network and your uh, local network, there's some larger organizations that have mentorship programs that you can check into as well. Absolutely. And, you know, I, and I'm also not above paying for it. And that was, <laughs> that's one of the things that I talked about uh, that, that I also have on this slide is, um, you know, I became a member of Solo Practice University and through there got several attorney mentors. Um, so, you know, it cost me a little bit of money, but it turned out to be way worth it because they were so helpful to me. And then I also took some substantive classes with them through Solo Practice University. So that might be an option that you want to explore as well. But, you know, um, just, you know, when you think of networking, I think think more one-on-one -on -one as much as possible versus going to an event where there's a lot of attorneys and you feel a little bit intimidated and you don't really get the opportunity to make real connections. So that's really going to be the key in networking is think kind of like one-on-one -on -one or small setting where there's only a couple attorneys there. Um, that's where you'll really uh, be able to make connections and, and build a relationship. And our next slide is, oh, clients, where are thou, part one. <laughs> and, and this is a, a really big challenge for, you know, it, it's hard enough coming out of school and you have student loans that you're thinking of and how are you going to support yourself and you need to build a practice. And now how, how am I going to generate clients? So what was that like for you? You mentioned social media earlier. Um, we do chat, um, you know, regularly on Twitter. So we know that you um, are, are very active in social media. But what are some of the other um, areas that have worked for you? Um, so when I was first starting out, just sending out the announcement and letting everyone that I know know. I mean, you have to let everyone know. Like, don't be shy at all. You know, contact your professors, old attorneys um, that you know, um, you know, your hairdresser, <laughs> your mother's friends, your aunts, your uncles, you know, everyone that you know, because they will be, they, they already trust you. They already know you. Um, they already believe in your integrity. Uh, so they'll be more likely to trust you and, and send a couple of cases your way. And I got, you know, my first three cases were all, two of them were friends, and one of them was a friend of my sister's. So those are my first three cases. Um, so I definitely farm who you know, because that's where you'll usually get your first couple of cases from and you'll get to get some experience, and it'll be a little bit more comfortable because you'll already know those people or have some connection to them, so it's not like someone in, someone coming in off the street. Um, and then the referral sources, we just talked about mentorship. Those attorneys are going to be huge for sending you potential uh, clients. So that's, that's a big deal. And, and, and always be thinking about how you can network. One of the things that I know a lot of other attorneys do that I've done as well is meet for coffee, meet other professionals for coffee, for example, you know, maybe you want to meet with financial planners, accountants, um, you know, web designers. I mean, really, it could be any kind of other service professional that you might want to meet with, too, because you guys may have clients that you can send back and forth to each other. Um, so think about, you know, who interacts with your clients. Maybe if you're in family law, a family therapist, perhaps, would be a good person for you to connect with, where you guys could potentially send, you know, maybe if you have a case where, it turns out they don't want to get divorced. They decide they want to work on their marriage. You can send them to the therapist, and vice versa. People who decide they're going to get divorced, the therapist can send them to you type of thing. So those kinds of um, more one-on-one -on -one networking type of things is important. And establishing your web presence, and I love your website, but it's important that I think a lot of people get caught up in, oh, I'm still working on my website. I'm still working on my website. I I know attorneys who have been working on their first website for over a year now, and um, who, who knows how much they've invested in it. And there's something to be said for you know um, versions and get your first version up and and get it going and get your practice started, and then you're going to make changes. You're going to make changes in your business, and you're going to make changes in your website. So what was that like for you? Well, what I did was those first couple of clients that I had, I took the money that I had made from those clients and invested it in, start, in creating my website. Maybe I got some business cards, and then I think I had a little left over that I just kind of left in the bank. But um, and that's, that tells you how cheap I was with, the, with my website. I think I spent a total of like $600 on my website, and to this day I don't think I've even reached $2,000. I think I've spent maybe 1500 total over the last year on my website, you know, upgrading it and stuff. So um, I say be cheap. <laughs> um, make it, you know, professional, but it doesn't have to be expensive to be professional. You don't necessarily need a web designer. 
Um, I bought a logo, and that was like three hundred dollars of the six hundred bucks I spent. Um, and then you know I have a, my best friend's a craft, graphic designer, and she knew someone who was like a web coder. So I bought a WordPress theme for twenty seven bucks. Uh, I had this web coder, you know, customize it for me somewhat, which cost me a couple hundred dollars, and and that was it. Boom, it was up, and I put a lot of energy and my time and, and effort into it. So I think that's, you know, it, it was kind of like an amalgamation of pe different people working on it, but it worked out, and it was fairly inexpensive, and I got so many compliments. I still get so many compliments on my site to this day, and I still... You know, I haven't spent nearly as much as some of the other people I know <laughs> who spent $10,000 on their first site. So you don't need to do that. Um, get it up. That's the first thing. You know, just get it up there. I agree uh, with Chelsea wholeheartedly on that. And then make it interactive. Give people a reason to come back, um, you know, update content, but also, you know, maybe have a little video, especially if you're a virtual office or you're thinking of starting a virtual office, have a video of yourself, you know, um, I haven't done this yet, but I, I know a lot of attorneys that have done it and they've gotten, you know, good feedback from it. You can really express your personality more uh, through video, so that's why I recommend it. You, uh, you might also want to, you know, create a checklist, like I have the Online Entrepreneur's Legal Checklist on my website. So if someone subscribes to my newsletter, they will get this, you know, free, you know, checklist for them that is a useful uh, tool for them. Um, so, you know, something like that where they can download something or maybe I've seen like bankruptcy quizzes on bankruptcy lawyers' websites where they say, you know, they ask them a series of questions and that tells them whether they can file for bank, whether they should file or, you know, where they're at in the filing process kind of thing. So you could do something like that. Of course, you want to have disclaimers on it. But, um, but I think n another thing that so many lawyers don't do that you really should do is express your personality because clients are buying you. So, you know, show who you are, you know, kind of, you know, make it colorful, you know, have interesting pictures instead of just like the typical boring, you know, picture. Um, you know, so just really express your personality and, and don't be so legalese. You know, a lot of lawyers try to impress other lawyers with, I did clerkships here and I did, you know, law review and I did this and I did that. Clients don't care about any of that, you know. so. Share your bio, but do it in a way that really resonates with clients. Talk about the experiences that you had that make you care about what their legal matter is or passionate about this particular area of law. Um, and just speak their language. Don't speak legalese because that's a huge turnoff for clients. So I think those are the, the key tips to keep in mind when you know, creating your first website. I completely agree. And um, really establishing that commonality um, between you and your potential client. We talked a little bit about that earlier, and I think that that really resonates when displayed through a website. They are coming to you in a time of need, potentially in a time of uh, hardship or something traumatic that's going on in their life or something really exciting, something new that is starting for them. And they want to be able to relate to that person, and that is going to be make them feel more comfortable and also feel like they can open up and talk to you, which is the type of relationship that they should have you know, with any um, professional, their attorney, their, their doctor, their accountant. They should be able to share you know, information willingly, and that's going to make them more comfortable. So I completely agree. Personality is a huge part of your website, and um, you know, the, the steps at the courthouse are not always that welcoming. So, you know, having, <laughs> right, exactly. having or the scales of justice. So having you know pictures of yourself and really making them feel comfortable and at home, and that this is somebody that they're going to be able to relate to, is going to um, help you convert potential um, potential clients into paying uh, clients when they come and visit your site for the first time. Definitely, and definitely smile in your picture because that's welcoming. Please don't have the scary lawyer look because that's going to scare clients away. <laughs> And um, where, you know, where do you go next? So you have a website. You have um, established that, you know, online personality that's going to make your clients relate to you. What is the, the second phase or the second part of um, attracting clients and establishing that client base? So once you have your website up, no one's necessarily going to come to it just because it's there. You know, believe it or not, I know it's shocking. I, I felt the same way. I was like, why isn't more? Why aren't more people visiting my site? But you have to kind of drum up interest and kind of connect with people someplace and send them back to your site. 
Um, so this is where the niche comes in really, really handy because if you know, um, you know, your particular type of client, for me, my client is going to be, you know, kind of like under 35 um, and starting their own business. You know, that's, those are the kind of the two key things. They're going to be fairly young, very comfortable with technology, very web-based uh, type of clients. So for me, you know, knowing where they hung out made it so it was much easier knowing it, it, because I had that narrow niche. So, uh, for example, I write for a blog, I guess blog for under30ceo.com. Um, I also have written for this. I also write a column for this magazine called YFS Magazine, which is young, fabulous, and self-employed. <laughs> and, and these are, you know, these are places where people who are young and who are starting their own businesses hang out. This is the sites that they go to that they visit regularly. And so when they see legal information related to starting a business from me, they, you know, can come back to my site. I get a lot of referrals from both of those sites. So, um, and that's not the only place. I mean, I've guest blogged in other places as well, but really basically focused on where young lawyer, uh, young entrepreneurs are. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you are, for example, maybe you're like a divorced lawyer that specializes in representing women or a certain type of woman, you can, you know, there will be sites that are focused on, you know, um, you know, uh, information type sites or blogs for like moms, you know, uh, that might be a good place for you to guest blog every now and then or sites devoted to, um, you know, divorcees, like getting your groove back type of thing, <laughs> you know, when, after you get a divorce or when you're going through a divorce, those types of sites are going to be where your potential clients might be. And it's not always just online, too. You could do this in person if you think about, you know, where your clients hang out, what kind of clubs or organizations do they go to, what kind of events do they go to. I know my clients are all at South by Southwest, which is a conference that they have in Austin every year. And so now it's part of my business model to go to South by Southwest every year because I know I'm going to meet tons of potential clients. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, find out where your clients hang out. Um, so that's a big thing. And then the other thing is going to be creating content. You know, blogging is not an option. You have to do it nowadays because it's really going to help you show up in Google searches. And you're going to be able to express who you are. You'll express your personality why you're passionate about what you're doing, you know, who, you know, more about your life, you know, the more you're willing to share with them, the more open you become. I feel like clients really are attracted to that in blogging. So don't just blog about cases, you know, like case law. You can blog about that, but make it more homey and personable so that people who are not lawyers can get it and, you know, feel like it's worthwhile. And I mean, this will depend on your practice area somewhat too. But, and also, just to keep in mind, content doesn't mean just writing. So if you hate to write, which I doubt because you're a lawyer and you have to do so much writing as lawyers, but <laughs> if you do hate to write, you can just use video. I know other lawyers who do podcasts, you know, where they just kind of give a legal tip type of thing in their practice area and, you know, once a week for, you know, it's like a 10-minute video or 10-minute audio. So that's something to keep in mind. And just remember your audience. Think about the information that your audience wants. Um, Think about the things people ask you, you know, and uh, answer those questions that clients are always asking you in your blog. Absolutely. And remembering your audience is key, that relatability, your personality coming through in what you write. And um, I, I love the South by Southwest uh, example. And not only is it fun, you know, as, to just be able to go and attend, but it's also a, a great way for you to be, you know, kind of in your element and around um, potential clients. and you know, having a good time and, and just kind of being a, a normal person while also being able to drum up some business at the same time. So exactly. Identifying those areas and, and coming back to that niche again is it's so key and it makes it so much easier and more comfortable for you to establish a client base if you have that nailed down. Um, and the, the next piece would be um, sharing content, social media benefits and formulas. So um, we all know that we can find out, you know, what people are eating for dinner on Twitter, but can you also <laughs> use it? Can you also use it for business? Um, and I've personally had a, a lot of professional success using Twitter as a business tool. Um, but how how have you used that um, as an extension of your practice? Um, well, social media is huge, and that's something that I started with even before I started my practice. When I was still clerking for a judge, I started following solo attorneys. Um, I f started following attorneys who were in practice areas that I was considering. 
Um, and just, you know, from there it kind of built up. But by doing that, you can put yourself in front of people. Um, you, even if you send an email and don't get response, if you send 130 characters or whatever it is on Twitter, um, you know, you're going to get a response from people who you would think, you know, wouldn't have time for you. So that's one of the ways to start connecting with other lawyers in your field. Um, but also, I mean, it's, it, it, once you do that, it kind of snowballs into other things where you start to meet other people, you start to jump in on conversations, there's all kinds of Twitter chats that go on nowadays where you can get to know people. Um, so I think it's a great resource. It's also a great resource for staying on top of your practice area because the lawyers in your practice area are going to be talking about new laws that come up, changes, um, new things that they're trying, new ways that they're doing things. Um, so you'll be able to share your content but also be consuming the content of other lawyers and, you know, other professionals or, you know, potential clients. You'll be able to hear what they have to say. So I think it's just an invaluable tool nowadays. And it's a way to market yourself for free. I did not spend one dime on marketing. Still to this day, I don't have a marketing budget. My marketing budget is my time that I put into, you know, Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and now Google+. Plus. Um, so, and I've gotten two writing gigs from it. I write two columns. Um, you know, one of them I get paid to write. Uh, so, you know, I've also gotten so many opportunities for interviews, for, um, you know, opportunities to, to teach or to share the information that I have, um, mentorship, you know, being able to really establish my brand. All of that has come from social media. So it's huge. It's a great, great beneficial tool. It's great for young lawyers because we have more time than money, you know. So I highly, highly recommend it. And that actually wraps up our session for today. Um, so just kind of coming back through for a quick recap, figuring out what you want out of life, creating a practice based on that, creating a financial plan, choosing your niche, setting your fees, getting mentors, and getting clients. And we will be sending all of these slides out to our listeners um, following today's session, so you'll be able to go back through um, and review today's session as many times as you like. Rachel, we cannot thank you enough. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for sharing all of your experiences with us. I know this has been extremely helpful um, for our listeners and all of our law students and recent graduates or people um, embarking on the, on the solo path for the first time. And um, thank you so, so much for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Well, it's been my absolute pleasure. And, and just so everyone knows, um, a lot of the information that I share or, you know, expanding on some of the information I've shared, it, I've done on my column uh, for Solo Practice University. So if you go to solopracticeuniversity.com slash blog, um, you can pick, click on my picture and you'll see all the articles that I've written. Um, which are really geared towards young lawyers mostly. So some of the information that I've talked about will be expanded upon in those blogs. So that might be useful. I also um, have another blog, genyjd.com, geared towards young lawyers. Um, and you can always ask me questions or find me on Twitter or Facebook. Feel free to contact me. I get emails and, you know, Twitter messages all the time, and I always try to respond to them, although it does take me a couple of days sometimes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, and we do encourage everyone to follow Rachel on Twitter, check out her blog, check out her website, and definitely keep an eye because she is a rising star for sure, and we're so happy to have her today. Rachel, thanks so much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>